Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EPA WaterSense programs, Minimize Water Use in Mechanical and HVAC Systems Training. This webinar is being put on as part of the Hotel Challenge training series. I'm Laura Wetzel, a supporting contractor to EPA's WaterSense program, and I'll be moderating this presentation today. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce the three presenters you'll be hearing from today. Hosting this webinar is Stephanie Tanner. Stephanie is the lead engineer for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's WaterSense program. She is responsible for all technical aspects of the development of labeled products, including setting efficiency and performance criteria, as well as managing the certification process. Prior to EPA, she managed a water efficiency program for federal facilities and wrote a number of guides to water efficiency for federal facilities. She holds a BS in Marine Engineering from the Merchant Marine Academy and a Master of Engineering Management from the George Washington University. Our second speaker will be Roy Sieber with ERG. Roy has 25 years of water efficiency consulting experience, helping commercial and institutional facilities develop and implement water use efficiency and conservation initiatives. Roy specializes in all phases of program implementation, including strategic planning, facility assessment, technology evaluation, and performance monitoring, as well as field studies. In addition, Roy is the program manager of ERG's technical support for EPA's WaterSense program, and in that role has developed product specifications and a water efficiency best management practices guide for commercial and institutional facilities. Roy holds a BS degree in chemical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Finally, we'll wrap up the presentation with an informative case study on water efficient Mechanical Systems at Hyatt Regency Atlanta, presented by Randy Childers. Randy has been in the position of Senior Director of Engineering for Hyatt Regency Atlanta since 1994 and has been with the Hyatt for 33 years. He previously served Hyatt properties in Minneapolis, Hawaii, Chicago, and Kansas City. Randy is a Lead Green Associate and graduate of Georgia Tech's Finance and Accounting for Non-Financial Managers Program. He is committed to the premise that strong sustainability goals have strong financial benefits, a view shared by all of the Hyatt family. Hyatt reached the Atlanta's 35% reduction in energy and water consumption since 2000, generates more than $2 million per year in savings, giving strong support to this position. Let's review a few housekeeping items before we begin. All attendees have been muted just to minimize background noise, but if you have a question during the presentation, please do type it into the chat box on the upper right-hand side of your screen. We'll have a dedicated time for Q&A at appropriate breaks throughout the presentation. Lastly, we are recording this webinar for future viewing. You'll receive an email once it's posted to the WaterSense website, and when you do, please feel free to share the recording with any colleagues or business contacts that you think may benefit from it. Now I'd like to introduce Stephanie Tanner to review the agenda for today and start us off with an introduction to WaterSense and the Hotel Challenge. Stephanie? Thank you for those introductions, Laura, and welcome to all of you for joining us today. As Laura mentioned, I'll start by providing a brief overview of the WaterSense program, the intent of the hotel challenge, and some rationale for why you may want to save water at your hotel. Then I'll ask Roy to discuss water efficiency best management practices for cooling towers, single pass cooling equipment, chilled water systems, and steam boilers. Finally, Randy will present a case study about Hyatt Regency Atlanta's success implementing many of the best management practices that Roy is going to talk about. At the end of the webinar, I'll quickly review what we learned and talk about our upcoming training. For those of you who may not be familiar with WaterSense, I'll quickly introduce you to the program. WaterSense is a voluntary program launched by the EPA in 2006. We bring together a variety of stakeholders to promote water efficiency. 
We provide consumers with easy ways to save water, and we try to encourage innovation in manufacturing. Our end goal is to reduce water use and strain on water resources and infrastructure. The WaterSense label, which is displayed here on this slide, provides a simple way for consumers to identify water efficient products, homes, programs, and practices. With more than 11,000 different models of product have earned the WaterSense label to date. Products receiving the label have been independently certified for water efficiency and performance. In addition, to, in addition to labeling products, homes, and professional certification programs, we try to approach water efficiency from many different angles. We've developed best management practices for areas such as commercial buildings and landscapes to help facilities design, operate, and maintain their buildings and landscapes as efficiently as possible. WaterSense at Work, our best management practices guide for commercial facilities, is the focus for this training series. This slide shows all the residential and commercial products eligible for the WaterSense label. The label is generally reserved for products that use at least 20% less water and perform as well or better than their less efficient counterparts. Through 2013, WaterSense has helped consumers save a cumulative 757 billion gallons of water and 14.2 billion gallons of water and energy costs. We also work closely with the Energy Star program to help them include water factors in their specifications and to consider energy savings in ours. To help commercial and institutional facilities understand, manage, and reduce water use, we developed WaterSense at Work. The guidebook includes best management practices on water management planning, water use monitoring and education, sanitary fixtures and equipment, commercial kitchen equipment, outdoor water use, mechanical systems, laboratory and medical equipment, and on-site alternative sources of water. Product and equipment specific chapters in each of those main water use areas cover the water efficient operation and maintenance, retrofit, and replacement recommendations. WaterSense at Work also includes case studies that highlight the water energy and cost savings achieved by some CNI facilities who have implemented the BMPs. Now that we've released the BMPs and there are labeled products available, WaterSense is beginning to work with some commercial sectors individually to promote water efficiency. This year we're focusing on the hotel sector. This pie chart shows how water is typically used in hotels. As you can see, almost half of a hotel's water use comes from guest room sanitary use and hotel laundry. Outdoor water use for irrigation and pools and spas makes up the next largest portion of a hotel's typical water use. Hotels also use a significant amount of water in commercial kitchens and for building cooling and heating. Now that we know generally where your hotel's water is being used, let's talk about why you may want to reduce that water use. First and foremost, saving water can help reduce operating costs. Water and sewer costs are rising well above inflation with no sign of slowing down. In addition, saving water can save energy used to heat water. In your mechanical systems, reducing your heat load by making your equipment more energy efficient can also save quite a bit of water at your hotel. Saving water and energy can help improve equipment efficiency, which often reduces maintenance costs and man hours required for repairs. While reducing your bottom line, saving water may also increase your competitive advantage. A recent survey by TripAdvisor found that 79% of travelers place importance on choosing eco-friendly accommodations. And you can also demonstrate leadership in your community by participating in programs such as this Hotel Challenge. WaterSense launched the Hotel Challenge in February of this year to encourage and assist hotels in saving water. As part of the challenge, WaterSense is providing participants with the tools to act, assess water use and savings opportunities, change products and processes to incorporate BMPs, and to track water savings. Once your hotel takes the pledge on the WaterSense website, you'll receive emails that include several items to promote your participation, including a participant logo, a signed certificate of participation, and sample language to use in your in-room binders, websites, and guest services television. Every hotel that takes the pledge will also receive monthly water saving tips and reminders about WaterSense webinars. 
The training webinar series, including this one, will walk through the BMPs in WaterSense at Work that are applicable to hotels, and each training will feature a case study showing how hotels have implemented specific measures. WaterSense rec also recently released our water use and savings, sorry, our water use and savings evaluation tool, the water use tool, which can be used to help hotel managers and facility personnel identify, evaluate, and prioritize water savings projects. The water use tool associated with water assessment work uh, water assessment worksheets and other technical tools are available on our website. Before we begin talking in more detail about your mechanical systems, I'd like to open the floor to any questions about WaterSense and the hotel challenge. Remember that all attendees are muted just to reduce background noise during the presentation, so if you do have questions, please type them into the chat box at the right of your screen and we'll be addressing them as they're received. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions for now, so I'd like to invite Roy Sieber to cover water use and efficiency in mechanical and HVAC systems. Well, thank you, Laura, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, this next section of the presentation is going to provide uh, an overview of the mechanical systems that frequently occur in hotels. Uh, we're going to talk about how those systems use water and the steps that you can take to make them more efficient. And uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on the use of single-pass cooling water, chilled water systems used for space cooling, uh, cooling towers, which are typically associated with those chilled water systems, and uh, I'll wrap up with uh, steam boiler systems. Uh, so first, uh, let's focus on single-pass uh, cooling water. Um, Single-pass cooling water, if it's present, has the potential to be the single greatest water waster in a facility. And uh, by single-pass cooling water, uh, I'm talking about situations where city water is plumbed to a piece of equipment to remove heat. Uh, typically, that's uh, from a motor or, or from a compressor. And after use, after a single pass through that equipment, it goes right down the drain. And in a hotel, you might find that associated with an air conditioning unit, uh, perhaps a compressor on a freezer, a, a walk-in freezer or refrigerator, or a water-cooled ice machine. Um, often that flow of water is controlled uh, with a solenoid valve, so the water flows only when that motor or compressor is in operation. But in some cases, those valves fail and that water flows all the time, and that's where you can really get a lot of waste. If possible, we uh, recommend you uh, eliminate all instances of single-pass cooling. And you can do that by either replacing water-cooled equipment with air-cooled equipment, or providing cooling water from an existing chilled water loop if that's present. Uh, we've worked with several facilities that have replaced single-pass water-cooled air conditioning units with energy-efficient air-cooled units, and they've seen uh, significant savings with that change. In cases where you can't eliminate single-pass cooling water use, make sure you're using the absolute minimum quantity needed. Uh, check your equipment specs and make sure you're getting the maximum temperature rise in the water that you're applying because that's going to minimize the amount of water that you need to apply. Also, make sure the water turns off when the motor or compressor is not uh, running. That's a maintenance item that can typically need attention. In some cases, single-pass cooling water can be reused for another purpose, but it's best to eliminate it if you can. And uh, we're going to illustrate that point uh, with some dollar savings on the next slide. To just uh, give folks a little bit of perspective, these photos illustrate the potential magnitude of the saving opportunity, particularly in setups where the water flows continuously. So on the left, where the water appears to flow at not much more than a trickle, if that was flowing continuously, it would consume about a half a million gallons of water per year. 
and at uh, average water and sewer rates, that would cost a facility over $4,000. So you can see how those, uh, those costs add up quickly. And at the far right, you see uh, how a flow equivalent to a, a garden hose, that's a garden hose at full flow, well, if that was 24-7, it would amount to uh, over 3 million gallons per year and almost uh, $28,000. And uh, these flows can be lurking in your mechanical room, uh, sometimes uh, unknowingly. Uh, we did work with one facility uh, with a supplemental air conditioning unit consuming seven gallons a minute, which is about the flow that you see uh, on the far right. And uh, once they found out what that was costing them, which was over $20,000 a year, uh, they replaced that piece of equipment immediately with an air-cooled unit. Um, so again, this is kind of a little... Uh, insight into what the, how single pass cooling water costs add up. Fortunately, most facilities um, uh, with substantial cooling uh, loads uh, use recirculated chilled water systems. Uh, these systems have several key components which are identified in this sketch. Um, at the bottom, um, we show a heat exchange unit Heat exchange units um, are supplied with chilled water, and that's often uh, for the purposes of space cooling or some other uh, equipment cooling, and that's where the heat load comes from. At the center of this diagram, we show the chiller unit. Uh, that's generating the chilled water through a refrigeration process. Uh, typically, those chilled water loops are fully closed, and there should be very little water loss or consumption. But it's good practice to have a makeup meter on the chilled water loop, and if you're seeing consumption or continuous makeup, you may have a leak uh, that needs to be investigated or resolved. Uh, the uh, condenser on that refrigeration cycle can either be air-cooled or water-cooled. Larger units tend to be water-cooled using a cooling tower, and that's what we show at the top of this diagram. And we're going to discuss cooling towers in more detail on the following slides. So that we have everyone oriented to the discussion of cooling towers, I want to uh, take a moment to go over some of the basics uh, of their operation. The concept is fairly simple. Uh, water and air flow past each other, typically in a counter current or cross flow configuration. In this schematic illustration, water is introduced at the top and flows down, while air is drawn up th through the tower by a fan. As the air passes over the water, some water is evaporated, which removes heat and reduces the temperature of the water in the tower. Um, there are some inputs and outputs from the tower that are of interest, and I'm going to go through these on the next uh, several slides. Uh, but first, we have the circulated cooling water that is introduced into the tower to be cooled. Uh, this water is removing heat from a piece of equipment, uh, in this case a chiller. Some of this water is evaporated to remove heat. And this is uh, by design, and that's the purpose of the cooling tower. Uh, some minimal quantity uh, can be lost from the tower as droplet drift. Some water is discharged as blowdown to keep minerals from building up in the recirculated cooling tower water. And then to account for those water losses, uh, makeup water is added uh, to account for the losses due to evaporation, drift, and blowdown. And we'll go into each of these in a little more detail. Evaporation is the primary function of the cooling tower, and that is how most of the heat is carried away from the system. Uh, you've, experienced, you've all experienced that if you've ever felt that chill when you get out of a swimming pool on a breezy day, even if it's a warm day. Uh, that, that chill is, is from evaporative cooling, and that's the principle that cooling towers use to remove heat. Since we want that cooling to occur, uh, evaporation is not the focus of water efficiency. With that said, and as Stephanie mentioned, anything you can do to make your chiller plant more energy efficient will lower your cooling load and thereby reduce the amount of water needed for evaporation. All cooling towers have a discharge water stream referred to as either blowdown or bleed off. Uh, we're going to refer to it blowdown in this presentation. The reason for the blowdown is to keep minerals or dissolved solids from building up in the water circulated through the tower. 
The makeup water supply to the tower contains dissolved solids. As water evaporates, these dissolved solids stay in circulation and begin to get concentrated over time. And if those concentrations get too high, the solids will begin to form scale on the surfaces of the chiller system, which can degrade performance or damage equipment. Therefore, some water is regularly discharged or blown down to keep these dissolved solids in check. The blowdown is typically controlled by a conductivity meter or uh, and controller, and careful blowdown control offers best opportunity for savings in a cooling tower system. We're going to talk further about the control of blowdown in a moment, but to complete the discussion of water losses from a cooling tower, I wanted to mention two other issues. Beyond the water evaporated, some water can be lost due to drift or splash, let, splash out. In a well-designed tower, this should be minimal. However, if you're noticing visible droplets exiting the tower or water ponding near the tower, this may require some attention in your installation. The other maintenance item to be aware of is cooling tower overflow. Most towers are equipped with an overflow drain to prevent overfilling the tower basin in the event of an equipment malfunction. If the level sensor or fill valve in the tower fails, this can cause an overflow to the drain without the facility staff realizing it immediately. And that's what the uh, photo in the right-hand corner uh, shows. That's a situation where the float valve controlling the tower um, was, had some leak by, that water was uh, constantly overflowing, that, that drain pipe in the center of that photo, and that went on for a while before the facility staff recognize that that was occurring. Since that photo is inside the tower, you wouldn't normally see that unless you open the uh, um, uh, access door to the tower. If the overflow drain is equipped with an alarm, such a problem can be identified immediately and promptly corrected, but it's also something that you should check on a regular basis uh, if you don't have such an alarm system. Now we're going to uh, go into the control of blowdown in a little more depth. If you recall our schematic of the cooling tower, the only water added to the system was makeup water. When operating properly, the only significant ways water leaves the system is through evaporation and blowdown. Drift should be negligible. The amount of water that is evaporated is a function of the heat load on the cooling tower. Therefore, in order to reduce the quantity of makeup water we need to supply, we need to minimize the quantity of blowdown water. But we can't reduce it too much or the minerals can build up to the point of being a problem. And that's what you want to do is hit that sweet spot. Um, the, the, the concept is expressed uh, by the term cycles of concentration of the cooling tower. And that is typically calculated as the concentration of dissolved solids, frequently measured as conductivity in the blowdown water, divided by the conductivity of the makeup water. Let's go through a simple calculation to illustrate that concept further. Let's say our cooling tower is supplied with makeup water with conductivity of 500 units. The conductivity of the blowdown, which is the conductivity of the water circulating through the tower, is 2,750 in this example. The cycles of concentration is conductivity of the blowdown divided by conductivity of the makeup, 2,750 divided by 500, is 5.5 cycles. One other important concept related to cycles of concentration is it should be approximately equal to the ratio of the quantity of makeup water divided by blowdown water. So I'm going to actually hit you with a little bit of algebra here. Um, hopefully uh, you'll forgive me for that. The amount of dissolved solids coming into the tower system has to be equal to the amount of dissolved solids exiting the system. We have the quantity of makeup water Q times concentration in makeup water C equals quantity of blowdown times concentration of dissolved solids in the blowdown. If you rearrange that equation, we see that cycles of concentration is the ratio of the quantity of makeup water to blowdown water or the ratio of dissolved solids concentration in blowdown water to makeup water. So there's two different ways we can, we can calculate that. 
Now that we've reviewed the operation principles, let's review some best management practices. To maximize the water efficiency of your cooling tower, you want to pay careful attention to the quantity of makeup water and blowdown water used if, it is equipped, if you're equipped with meters and can measure that. If you don't have meters, consider installing them. Regularly monitoring the quantities of water used and tracking trends over time can help you identify and address problems before they linger. Pay regular attention to the conductivity of the water in your tower and calculate your cycles of concentration. If your tower is not cycling up as expected, it may mean your control system is not working properly or there is an unintentional loss of water from the tower. That might be a, a leaking fill valve going down the pipe like I showed earlier. Maximizing your cycles of concentration is the most important way to achieve efficient use of water in your tower. Um, work with your water treatment vendor uh, that shares, work, or work with a water treatment vendor that shares your goal to achieve water efficiency. Working together, establish tycle, uh, target cycles of concentration based on your local water chemistry and water treatment plan. If you have makeup and blowdown meters, Evaluate the ratio of makeup to blowdown quantity as a double check on your cycles of concentration. Typically, your treatment vendor will leave behind uh, or email you a written report on the status of your cooling tower chemistry each time they visit to check your system. This is often done on a monthly basis. Review the reports to make sure your cycles of concentration are being maintained. I have a sample report on the next slide that we can go over to orient you towards that. Making, uh, making sure your cooling plant is energy efficient will also help you save water because it will reduce your evaporative cooling load. Make sure your heat transfer surfaces remain clean and chilled water piping and other equipment is properly insulated. This is an excerpt uh, from a pretty typical water treatment report. The format of these reports can differ, uh, but the information is usually the same. Uh, the report typically includes conductivity of makeup water uh, and cooling tower water. And I just wanted to make it clear that the water in the cooling tower is the water that gets blown down. So the cooling tower water and the blowdown water are, are one in the, uh, the same thing. Uh, dividing uh, blowdown conductivity uh, by makeup conductivity, in this case, gives us a little over six cycles, which is not, uh, not too bad. We want to try to be at six cycles or above. One other thing to be aware of uh, that you can look at in these reports, um, where does your conductivity of your tower uh, sit with respect to your control point? Typically, that control point will be set because that's where your cycles of concentration is uh, going to come from. In the example of this report, the um, conductivity is uh, 2,755. Their control point is they want to keep it uh, under 2,750. So they're essentially sitting right at their control point, which is, uh, which is where they want to be for maximum water efficiency. In terms of retrofits to get the most efficiency from your tower, uh, and we've hit up on some of these already, uh, you can install an automatic controller based on conductivity to control your blowdown and maximize your cycles. You can install makeup and blowdown meters to track your water use on an ongoing basis uh, and monitor trends, taking corrective actions if necessary. And one important cost-saving measure uh, uh, that's available with uh, uh, some meters, if, they're, uh, if you can get agreement from your water utility, is you can get a sewer deduction in some cases for the water that is evaporated, and that uh, can be a uh, significant cost savings uh, since cooling towers are frequently one of your big water users. Uh, taking steps to improve the water quality uh, in your tower or supply uh, to your tower. Uh, through such means as side stream filtration to remove sediment or water softening if water hardness is a problem in your area can allow you to increase your cycles of concentration and your water treatment vendor can advise you on those options. 
This next chart shows the type of savings that can be achieved by increasing cycles of concentration. And uh, to get uh, the appropriate savings quantity, read initial cycles of concentration on the left and then across to new cycles of concentration along the top. top. So for example, improving from three cycles to six cycles would provide 20% reduction in cooling water use. This, um, this next chart shows water consumption for a example 100 ton tower at various cycles of concentration. Uh, so we see consumption in gallons per day on, uh, on the left and then cycles of concentration across the bottom. And you can see from the shape that as you get the higher cycles, there is a flattening of uh, the curve since a greater portion of the water use is then related to evaporation and uh, we're no longer seeing as much savings as we increase the cycles. But you want to get out to that flat part of the curve and that's why we say you know, try to get to six cycles or above if uh, your uh, water quality will allow you to do that. One excellent project idea to consider, um, particularly if your hotel is located in a hot, humid climate, is to collect the condensate that forms on air handler cooling coils and uh, use it as makeup water to the cooling tower. Uh, condensate is typically drained to the sewer, but since it's generated in highest quantity when the load to your cooling tower is the highest, it, uh, it makes for an excellent source of cold, clean water. The biggest challenge uh, for implementing that type of reuse project is the plumbing required to get water from the air handlers uh, or the air conditioning units to the cooling tower. Uh, however, if the pipe runs aren't too long or complicated, this can be a very cost-effective uh, project idea to implement. Um, just to uh, give uh, folks a sense of where that uh, may make the most sense, uh, this chart shows the relative cooling loads uh, for ventilation air associated with uh, dehumidification in blue. That's the energy or the cooling requirement to uh, condense uh, moisture out of the air and temperature reduction or sensible heat in, in red. And uh, you can see that frequently it's that dehumidification is really where the, the heavy cooling load is coming from. Uh, so any locations with a big blue bar uh, is going to generate a lot of air conditioning condensate and those uh, are particularly good uh, lo uh, candidate locations for condensate recovery. Um, as you can see the southeast is uh, prime, prime real estate. Um, so I, I really love these projects because the thermodynamics work out so well. Uh, so please consider if your hotel is a candidate for this type of retrofit. That uh, wraps up the, the cooling tower portion. We're going to move on to um, uh, steam boilers. Um, the, that's, and this, that's the last mechanical system that we're going to focus on. Uh, there's two uh, main, main types, uh, hot water boilers and steam boilers. Uh, hot water boilers are either open systems, uh, producing hot water for domestic consumption or laundry operations, or recirculating closed systems used for space heating. And uh, the domestic hot water um, use and efficiency was covered in a, a, a separate webinar, Washing 101, um, and that's available on the WaterSense website. Uh, recirculating closed hot water systems for space heating should have very little makeup water demand. Uh, similar to the closed chilled water systems, you can put a, a makeup meter in place to make sure you don't have any losses or leaks, uh, but beyond that, we're not going to really focus on that uh, today. The, the rest of this is uh, focused on steam boilers. Um, this very simple, simple boiler sketch uh, is here to uh, orient everyone to the terms I'm going to be using. Uh, steam is produced in the boiler and used for space heating or potentially other uses. Once the steam gives up its heat, it condenses back to water and is normally collected and returned to the boiler. Similar to cooling towers, over time, Minerals can uh, build up in the boiler and a periodic blowdown is required uh, to remove them from the system. This blowdown is very hot and frequently there is tempering water, a stream, uh, cold water, cold city water, that's mixed with the blowdown to reduce the temperature below 140 degrees so it can be discharged to the sewer. 
and uh, makeup water is provided to the boiler to make up for steam losses and the boiler blowdown. The most important feature of an efficient system is capturing the steam condensate and returning it to the boiler. Return of this high quality hot water reduces both water use and energy demand on the boiler system. The key to an efficient boiler operation is to keep all components in good working order. Check steam and water lines for leaks and check and maintain steam traps so they are functioning properly. Regularly clean and inspect boiler water and fire tubes for good heat transfer and tune up your boiler uh, for efficient firing. Make sure steam lines and condensate return lines are properly insulated to prevent heat loss. One area that deserves careful attention and where we have frequently seen a water saving opportunity is tempering water application. Tempering water is often applied where hot water is discharged to drain. This could be on a boiler water blowdown flash tank or condensate draining from a flash tank on a steam vent. These tempering water flows are frequently controlled by a temperature actuated solenoid valve. And if the temperature probe or the valve fails, tempering water can flow all the time even when it's not needed. And as we saw earlier, these types of continuous water flows can be big water wasters. Similar to cooling towers, uh, work with your water treatment vendor to make it clear that maximizing the efficient use of water in your boiler is one of your goals and uh, this will reduce your water use, your chemical use, and your overall cost. Again, the concepts presented earlier for cooling towers apply to steam boilers as well. Maximize your cycles of concentration by capturing as much steam condensate as possible and minimizing blowdown. Some potential retrofit options, if your hotel is not already so equipped, are listed here. Automatic control systems based on conductivity are available to control blowdown and manage chemical feed based on makeup water quantities. If hardness is a limiting factor, using a water softening system to pretreat your boiler feed water can help increase cycles of concentration. And regarding the discharge of hot condensate, using an expansion tank to hold and cool the condensate rather than adding tempering water, can reduce your overall water use. I want to just uh, highlight a couple of other resources that are available to amplify on some of the things uh, we talked about, uh, we're talking about today. As Stephanie mentioned earlier, WaterSense on its website has a, a water use tool, and that uh, provides savings estimates and best management practices for the mechanical uh, systems that we're talking about today, as well as all the other water uses in hotels. And uh, another, another resource that uh, has a lot of good information, particularly about cooling towers, is some work that AT&T AT &T has done in partnership with the Environmental Defense Funds. They've built a water management application tool called WaterMap, which calculates the costs and benefits of cooling tower efficiency improvements, and it also includes a neat cycles of concentration estimator. So you might want to take a look at that. They also have a, uh, I believe it's 12 YouTube videos uh, on a lot, a lot of educational material on cooling tower water use in particular. And uh, that can be found on the, through the URL that's listed here. Great, thank you very much, Roy. That was very informative. And so at this time, let's take another break for your questions. Please type your questions into the chat box and we'll address them as they come in. But while we're waiting on them to come in, I'm going to launch two quick polls for the audience. The first one asks how you control your cooling tower and then the second one that I'll launch will ask if you have any instances of single pass cooling at your hotel.
looks like a lot of the people listening in today uh, don't manage their own facility, but a good portion of you have automatic controls based on conductivity. All right, thanks for answering that first poll. I'm going to watch that second poll now. So while you're answering this second poll, I'll go ahead and start answering some of our questions or reading them off. So the first question that we received was wondering if there are any water sense labeled rainwater harvesting systems. Uh, this is Stephanie. Uh, the answer to that is no. Right now we don't have any water, uh, rainwater harvesting systems. There are some standards being developed um, by IATMO and the um, International Code Council uh, on rainwater harvesting systems, but right now WaterSense does not have any uh, labels for those products. Thanks, Stephanie. So Rich is wondering if we have any suggestions for a simple overflow alarm because costs can be high to add a new sensor. So Roy, do you have any general tips you can provide? Um, well, there's some. St a lot will depend on the actual configuration of that drain, and and uh, maybe influenced by your building automation system and and how you might want to tie that in or or not tie that in. There are some simple solutions that don't tie in, where it's just a maybe a um, red light with a aud audible alarm. Um, that's probably the least cost option that I'm aware of. But again, it's going to depend a lot on, on what your actual configuration looks like. Great. So can a blowdown device be added to an existing cooling tower? Um, oh, yeah, definitely yes. Um, it's uh, the, typically um, it's just going to be a, 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 the, the system's under pressure. So typically that blowdown line is just equipped with a solenoid valve. That valve is tied to a, uh, a, a meter, a uh, conductivity meter, and when the set point is hit, that valve is triggered and opens up and uh, releases the uh, blowdown water. Uh, as the blowdown is released, makeup water will enter the system, thereby reducing the conductivity within the system, and then when it's reduced below the set point, the valve will close and the system will, will be back in a, a steady state operation. So if you don't have an automatic controller, that, that I think is something that is a fairly simple um, control scheme to, uh, tr to introduce. Thanks. That was very informative. Can you well, describe the scale uh, bactericide and corrosion chemicals that may be needed for recirculating cooling towers. There may be some environmental trade-offs um, with increased chemical use and discharge when you're saving water in cooling towers. Um, I think the, well, there's a whole variety of, of chemical additives that um, uh, can be applied. In fact, there's, there's um, approaches beyond just a pure chemical treatment scheme. There's there's other electromagnet magnetic systems out there. There's ozonation rather than a chemical biocide. So there's a lot of options. My recommendation and there, and the appropriate strategy for your facility is going to depend a lot on your particular facility's water chemistry. So my recommendation is to you know connect with a reputable, experienced um, vendor and, br and bring them on board and, and work with them uh, to develop a, a scheme that's appropriate for your facility. And in particular, if either through your jurisdiction or just because of, of your philosophy, 
you want to stay away from um, certain chemical treatment regimes, um, th there's solutions out there that can enable you to do that. Great. And is there a generally referenced number as to how much energy efficiency is lost for every centimeter of scale? Uh, there may be, but I don't have that at my fingertips. <laughs> so um, I, I, you don't I know everything. I, I, can't, I can't really respond to that in, a, in an informed way. Well, thanks for trying. <laughs> Finally, are there any different approaches that you can consider when using source water uh, from other than other than municipal sources? For example, municipal systems typically add different minerals to achieve different goals. And is this important to the system efficiency with respect to water usage? Yeah, it, it can be. And it's one of the reasons why I really like that, let's say, that air um, handler condensate project. Uh, because if you think about it, the, the water coming off uh, that's, that's sort of forming on those cooling coils and is, is collecting, that's essentially distilled water or close to distilled water quality because it's, it's getting distilled out of the atmosphere. So that water has a very low mineral uh, content. It has some other issues with it. It can be corrosive because it is so pure. But from a mineral standpoint, it, it's, it's, it's very pure and uh, almost universally will have less mineral content than the city water. So um, you get the added benefit. Not only are you reusing that water, you get the added benefit of you can actually improve your cycles of concentration because you're supplying the tower with water that's of higher quality. Now, that's the case of air handler condensate. If you're, let's say, doing some rainwater harvesting or you have other uh, sources of um, alternate sources of water, they're going to have some different quality issues. Sometimes. Um, from a mineral standpoint, they may give you some benefit compared to city water, sometimes not. So um, you'd have to go through that on a case-specific basis. But um, uh, alternate sources of water can give you some, some quality benefits depending upon uh, where they're coming from and how you're, how you're treating them. Um, it introduces another thought as well of if you're capturing alternate sources, you know, let's say many sources, you're capturing condensate and rainwater, you might want to give some consideration to whether it's better to keep them segregated and use them segregated or allow them to co-mingle. Um, so those are kind of some of the thought processes you, um, you should be going through. So it's an excellent question. So if there is a hotel in a tropical area like San Juan, Puerto Rico, they could use rainwater harvesting for cooling? Um, potentially, if there's a lot of rainfall, the um, the the design analysis you'd have to go through is, and, and it's the case always when you have, you're using an alternate source, you need to match the quantity and the quality with the use. So the quality may be fine. They'd have to see what their frequency of rainfall is, what size capture area they have available to them, how much water is that going to supply, and often the big cost item in such a system can be the holding tank. So. They have to, you'd have to go through those calculations, but uh, places with, with frequent rain um, or large frequent rainfalls can, you know, at least they have that going for them, so it's a good starting point. Great. And finally, one last question before we move on. Do you have any examples about how environmental health and safety, maintenance, design, and engineering members of the same organization can work together to ensure optimization of cooling towers in terms of their safety, like Legionella, and conservation? Well, it's a great question, and, and certainly what the questioner is suggesting, <laughs> I would wholeheartedly endorse. Um, I, I can't cite a specific example of where I've seen a team with all those members um, come together. Um, on one of those projects, but um, you know, none of this stuff can be done in a vacuum. And um, that that team approach that, that brings together all those considerations, I think, would be important. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Well, it looks like that's our last question for now, but we'll still have another round after we hear from Randy Childers on how Hyatt Regency Atlanta has put all of these great best practices into action. Randy? Thanks, Laura. Um, very pleased to have the opportunity to uh, uh, share our story, and uh, I think you'll find that uh, a lot of this ties in very closely to uh, information that Roy has shared. Uh, we have uh, had the opportunity over the years to implement a great deal of what he suggested, and I think I can show you uh, uh, how that has impacted uh, our property and our bottom line. Uh, and to that end, uh, the, the next slide uh, uh, I think illustrates that very well and uh, a very com in a very compelling way. Uh, the blue line is our water consumption uh, going back as far as 1992, and uh, the red line is the cost uh, per thousand gallons. Uh, <clears throat> now, you will note that uh, uh, the um, uh, cost of water in Atlanta has gone up dramatically uh, since uh, 2000. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, uh, but uh, regardless, uh, it's the way it is. Uh, and we have one of the highest uh, water costs uh, in the nation. At the same time, you'll see that uh, we've reacted uh, pretty successfully uh, to both those increase in costs. And in Atlanta, you'll recall that we've had a couple of bad droughts uh, in the southeast uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, that have also compelled us to, to look for ways to be more efficient with our water usage. Uh, so when you look at the slide, uh, you know, one of the things I like to point out is that in 2000, when we, were, uh, when we had reduced our water use from uh, 72 million gallons a year, or from 79, almost 80 million uh, gallons a year to 72, we thought we were doing pretty well. Uh, now we're at uh, 36 million gallons a year, uh, almost exactly half of uh, where we were in 2000. Uh, uh, the avoided cost represented uh, by that uh, is over a million dollars a year. If we still used water um, at the rate that we did in 2000 at uh, 2013 cost, uh, we'd be paying a million dollars more a year uh, for our water sewer combined. Next slide, please. Let me give you a little background about our property. Uh, High Regency Atlanta opened in 1967 uh, with expansions in 1970, 1981, and 1995. Uh, we've just completed a round of major renovations. Uh, this is a historic property, uh, both to the city of Atlanta uh, and to the Hyatt uh, Hotel chain. Uh, it was our first large hotel. It is the first uh, atrium hotel in the world. Uh, it was designed by John Portman. Uh, uh, was a real groundbreaker for both him, uh, for the city of Atlanta, and for the Hyatt chain. Uh, with the expansions over the years, we're now uh, just under one and a half million square feet, uh, covering a full city block, 1,260 guest rooms. Uh, we have three restaurants. In that opening uh, picture, uh, you notice the uh, blue bubble. Those of you who are familiar with Atlanta are no uh, doubt also uh, familiar with the iconic Polaris restaurant that sits on top of our property. We had. That um, um, restaurant had been closed for 10 years, and we reopened it this past Tuesday. We're very proud of it, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite a sight. Uh, beautiful, beautiful view from there. Uh, we also have an outdoor pool and sun deck, 180,000 square feet of indoor meeting space and conference space and catering services to support that space. Next slide, please. Uh, we've had a lot of success here uh, with our, both our energy and our water conservation, and I've uh, often been asked, you know, what our strategies are <clears throat> that uh, have helped us. And I've 
generalize them to some extent. <clears throat> uh, I believe that it's extremely important to have a long-term capital plan that looks at all your future projects, uh, your building, your building system projects, roofs, chillers, boilers, as well as your renovations, HVAC, glazing, uh, everything that uh, potentially is going to happen in your property, just to get it down and uh, project it at some point in the future at some uh, dollar cost, so that you keep track of all those uh, systems and uh, equipment that uh, will need to be replaced at some point in the future on some cycle. Uh, when I'm projecting uh, replacement of major systems, mechanical systems, uh, um, most notably, uh, I do consider uh, increases in efficiency uh, and allow the potential ROI from the replacement of those systems to influence the timing of, of those projects. Uh, uh, so to give you an example, on a chiller project, uh, we might have uh, compelling improvements in efficiency uh, that might influence the timing of that project uh, so that we uh, might not necessarily run that chiller out to its 25-year projected life cycle. Uh, we might decide uh, to replace it sooner if the uh, economics support it. One of the keys to operating a large campus type property such as ours is, uh, and I think any property, uh, is to have a fully implemented building automation system. It has to be a high priority. It has to, uh, it has to uh, have uh, a very deep uh, penetration into all your systems. It has to have a handle on, on uh, all of your major systems. and. Uh, the more that you have under control of your BAS, the better. Uh, I can't overemphasize uh, how important that is, because if you can't see it, you can't track it, you can't trend it, uh, you can't analyze it, then you really are not in a position to optimize your efficiency. Uh, we have a, an effective and empowered green team at the hotel, which helps us uh, uh, at the operational level, make sure that the systems that we put in place uh, are effective and working for us, uh, and we keep them very engaged in that process, uh, as well as everyone else in the property. And we like to take credit for and pride in our achievements and share that amongst the, the whole hotel team. Uh, and uh, when it comes especially uh, to any operational strategy or capital planning, uh, uh, my best advice is to be relentless. Uh, I have had great success through persistence and uh, getting the things that we believe are important um, uh, addressed uh, in a timely manner, um, and if not timely, eventually. Next slide. As Roy uh, mentioned, cooling towers are, uh, when we focus on water, uh, one of our primary focuses. Uh, cooling towers are critical. Uh, managing, managing them properly uh, uh, has a huge impact on our water uh, conservation. Uh, we have about 3,000 tons between two integrated plants, uh, six towers and in, in two installations uh, on our property. The peak cooling load uh, runs around 2,000 tons for our 1.5 million square feet. Um, uh, Roy spent a lot of time talking about cycles of concentration. Over the last five, uh, 15 years, we have raised our cycles of concentration from 5 to 8. Um, uh, through uh, our partnership with NALCO, our water treatment uh, uh, company, uh, and consulting with our mechanical consultant. Uh, we've achieved that through conductivity metering and trace monitoring, uh, the trade name uh, for NALCO's uh, trace monitoring system, which uh, uh, reads a trace chemical uh, in our treatment of our cooling towers uh, to maintain uh, both chemical treatment and to, uh, uh, to monitor conductivity to automate our blowdown based on that. It's not timed or manually blown down. 
Uh, we do make up, we do monitor or meter rather our makeup water and our blow down and submit that to the city of Atlanta for a sewer credit. Uh, I have found in, in uh, uh, all of my locations uh, over my career that I have been able to do that. Uh, most, uh, most not all, but certainly most uh, uh, utilities and uh, municipalities uh, will allow a sewer credit. Typically, you do have to monitor both your makeup and your blowdown and take the difference as an evaporative credit. Uh, placing softeners on the makeup water is a strategy uh, that can work well. Uh, uh, however, our water in Atlanta, one of our few water advantages, uh, is that our water is uh, pretty soft. Uh, so we don't have a lot of uh, uh, hardness in the water uh, to start with. Uh, but we are considering uh, installation of a softener bank to remove uh, the hardness uh, in our towers to further extend our cycles of concentration. Uh, it's something that we're looking at at this time. Next, please. We do utilize uh, free water as cooling uh, tower makeup. Uh, uh, we are currently capturing condensate from eight uh, major air handler units and 800 fan coil units. The 800 fan coil units from our original uh, uh, sleeping room, guest room tower uh, were conveniently located to our principal cooling tower. And uh, we were able to implement this with very reasonable cost. Uh, the cost to implement was, as Roy suggested, uh, primarily piping. Uh, and we are lucky enough that we can collect that without any pumping or storage and run it uh, directly, um, unmetered, uncontrolled, back to our cooling towers. Uh, as Roy suggested, uh, uh, as demand on your towers goes up, your condensate uh, generation goes up, so they are linked very nicely. There's a great synergy uh, that uh, contributes more condensate water at the time when you need it most. And as he mentioned, uh, the conductivity is very low. It's cool. Uh, so all those things help. And it's uh, essentially free after the initial investment in uh, piping uh, and possibly in pumping. Uh, uh, and for us, the simple payback was six months. And the internal rate of return on that project uh, is over 200%. Not bad, huh? Next slide, please. Uh, I heard a question uh, earlier about rainwater collection. Uh, we are investigating that. We strongly uh, desire to implement rainwater storage here. Our sister property, uh, the Grand Hyatt Atlanta in Buckhead, has successfully implemented a rainwater collection system, uh, about 30,000 gallons. Uh, but uh, some of the uh, challenges to rainwater collection uh, systems were ideally met at their property. Uh, and I thought that I would take a minute and mention it. The, the table that you're seeing is my uh, ROI calculations uh, on the project currently. And uh, uh, you can see that it looks like uh, uh, at this point that I can generate about a uh, 37 percent internal rate of return. So the project is very attractive um, uh, and we are looking to move forward. But I will say that uh, uh, that the cost of tanks uh, is probably probably the the biggest consideration uh, uh, in this project and that this uh, ROI calculation assumes that we're able to source, and, and install uh, repurposed, salvaged uh, water tanks, uh, which we've located and sourced and uh, uh, are evaluating to see if they will meet our, our uh, purposes. Uh, the return on investment isn't as attractive uh, uh, if we have to buy new tanks. It gets a little more challenging uh, to support the project. Uh, the other considerations on rainwater storage um, uh, are that the cost of implementation can be 
pretty high. As I mentioned, the cost of the tanks. Uh, typically, you're going to have to locate the tanks on grade. Uh, uh, very unlikely that you'd uh, be able to structurally support uh, with any existing structure without reinforcement uh, any installation of any tanks of any size uh, that aren't sitting on grade. Uh, you have to have the footprint available. and You have to evaluate uh, if you have that footprint, if you have the real estate available, uh, how that sits in proximity uh, to both uh, a convenient, cost-effective collection point for rainwater and your cooling towers. So, uh, you know, ideally, and this is the case uh, at our Grand Hyatt property, ideally uh, you have a location uh, on grade near your cooling towers, near uh, a point where you can tap into um, most, if not all, of your rainwater, uh, your rainwater piping, your stormwater piping, uh, to be able to collect it without pumping and then gravity drain it into your system again without pumping. And that's the case at our sister property, not the case in my my situation. So I thought I'd share that with you, and it certainly. Um, I think goes to a question that was asked earlier. Next slide, please. Uh, we have eliminated all of our single pass cooling long ago. Um, a lot of municipalities uh, do not allow it. Atlanta does not uh, and haven't for a long time. Uh, we had uh, 25 ice machines that, that were single pass cool. Uh, we eliminated those about 17 years ago. And, Ten years ago, eliminated single pass. And our last two air handlers that use single pass cooling, and there is no other instance in our property. Next slide, please. Uh, we re we completely modernized our chiller and boiler plants um, uh, over the years 2011 to 13. Uh, our partners in this. Um, uh, in this modernization of our plant, uh, we're Grumman Butkus Engineering, Siemens Controls, Womack and Associates, Custom Mechanical Train, and Cleaver Brooks. They did an outstanding job for us. Uh, we are utilizing uh, Siemens Demand Flow Control System, which is a variable primary system uh, uh, that uh, is implemented. Uh, and we are seeing uh, a 10.6% decrease in energy saving. Next slide, please. So some of the things, I'm not going to go through all these uh, in detail, but uh, some of the things that were implemented in our chiller optimization to generate that, uh, uh, that uh, savings uh, are shown here. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the other things that we've done to, uh, uh, outside of the mechanical systems to uh, save water in our property. Uh, we have low flow shower heads, uh, automatic faucets, uh, and ultra low flow toilets in all of our guest rooms and in all of our public space. Uh, we've replaced uh, uh, all of the urinals on the property with, uh, uh, with uh, waterless urinals. Um, with good success over a long period of time now. I will say that the, uh, that the type that you choose is critical. We tested um, some that did not work out for us, uh, and the ones that we're currently using uh, have worked very well. Uh, we've reduced our exterior landscaping. We've eliminated uh, um, uh, seasonal flowering that uh, um, demands a lot of watering. Uh, we use mulch to retard evaporation. Uh, we use uh, uh, water uh, uh, rain, rain sensors to uh, suppress our irrigation uh, when we're getting plenty of uh, rainfall. Uh, from an operational standpoint, we do not routinely set preset water uh, for our banquets. 
uh, or iced tea uh, served on request in our restaurants. Uh, we typically, unless asked to do otherwise, will set up central water stations for meetings uh, rather than put pitchers around the tables. Uh, we outsourced our laundry to a highly efficient commercial laundry which immediately uh, back in 2001 reduced our water consumption on property by 23 percent. Uh, we have a policy as do most hotels these days of replacing the sheets only on checkout or every three days or on request of course. Uh, and we do ask our guests to rehang their towels for reuse rather than throw them on the floor. Next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of um, uh, the impact of some of this, uh, we've reduced our water consumption by 35% since 2000. Uh, we saved 36 uh, million gallons in 2013 alone. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, we're saving nearly $1 million a year uh, on our water and sewer line. I will also mention that we're currently saving compared to 2000 a million dollars a year uh, in our energy. I, I'll, I'll give you one other statistic here uh, to kind of drive home the point of what a significant difference um, you know strong conservation measures can can have on bottom line for a property. Uh, we know through uh, the Smith Travel Research um, uh, data uh, on our competitive set in downtown Atlanta, the large hotels in downtown Atlanta. We know what they're, what the combined, not uh, by individual property, but we know that the seven large hotels in downtown Atlanta spend on average uh, for utilities $13.51 per occupied room. Uh, we're included in that average, uh, and we know that our cost per occupied room for utilities is $9.65. That's a huge variance, especially when you consider uh, that the 1351 uh, is the average, not the high, and uh, that we are part of that average. Um, so without us, that average would be much higher. Uh, if I look at that average of 1351 and apply it to our occupancy, uh, it verifies uh, exactly that if I were to use the average of our competitive set, um, uh, in cost, uh, uh, we would spend $2 million a year uh, more. Um, so our competitors have a $2 million disadvantage uh, on average uh, to the profitability of our hotel. Uh, we were awarded uh, by the Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge, which is part of the uh, EPA's uh, Energy Star Program and uh, their Better Building Challenge. Uh, we were awarded last year top water saver. Uh, in 2012, we received their uh, excellence award. Uh, we are TripAdvisor uh, Queen, uh, Green Leader Platinum, uh, and we are uh, Green Key Five Star Property. Next slide, please. This shows our water consumption. Uh, in terms of gallons per guest night. And you can see that we've gone from a high of 171 gallons used per guest night uh, down to 83 last year. A little uptick, uptick between 82 and 83. I'm happy to say uh, that, it's, um, uh, that it's largely because of uh, increase in business. Um, you can see uh, big drops from our laundry closing, uh, but that was also uh, impacted uh, by a number of uh, mechanical system improvements around that same time. And you can see that from 11 to 12 with our recent renovations, uh, the extensive replacement of plumbing fixtures uh, and our new chillers has had a dramatic impact on our water use. That concludes my slide. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Randy. You all really did implement some excellent water savings measures in your mechanical systems over the past several years. So we've already gotten a number of questions for Randy, but keep them coming and we'll start um, addressing them now. <clears throat> so Randy, 
in your evaluation of return on investment, did that include uh, the discount rate of money and or inflation, inflation rather, or was that just based on simple payback? Uh, if you, do you mind going back to that slide? Sure. Oop, there we, one, one, one more. Forward. One more forward. There we go. So the discount rate that I used uh, to calculate uh, was 10 percent. Um, and uh, the inflation uh, to the to the cash flows here, uh, I I figured uh, uh, three percent per year inflation in expenses, um, uh, in the cost of water in my uh, uh, my calculations to generate my cash flows. Did that? I hope that answered the the question. This uh, uh, our standard uh, um, a protocol for evaluating uh, net present value and uh, IR. Great. I think that answered the question. And you can feel free to add any clarifications, Rich, if you have more questions about that. But we have more questions about your fixture upgrades. So what is the shower head and faucet aerator flow rate that's being used in guest rooms? And what have you gotten any feedback, positive or negative, about them? Uh, we our our guest rooms are two GPM, uh, and our our faucets are uh, in our public areas are below uh, one, uh, and they are uh, one in our guest rooms one GPM. Uh, our toilets I think I mentioned are all 1.28. Uh, we we have Toto toilets uh, installed throughout the property. Uh, and Kohler uh, waterless urinals. And have you gotten any guest feedback about since you made those upgrades? Uh, nothing negative. Great. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sure that's the question if, if we have any complaints about that. Uh, you know, I think everybody appreciates uh, a, a nice hard shower wasting shower, <laughs> but uh, me too. Uh, but um, uh, I don't think anybody expects it. Okay. And when you did those retrofits for low flow faucets or toilets, did you have any issues with the drain pipes and stacks having enough slope for proper draining, or did you need to do any sort of no. retrofit for those? No, we had no issue at all. In fact, we have um, we have far fewer issues uh, with the new toilets and remember you know we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1400 uh, uh, toilets on this property uh, we have far fewer issues uh, with the 1.28 uh, toilet engineering uh, than we did when we were sending uh, three three and a half gallons uh, down with every flush that's good to hear and what did did you make any updates with your irrigation systems? We we are not a great irrigation example. I have very you know my city block is essentially paved. You know we are a sidewalk to sidewalk, uh, and I do have planter beds. I do have you know I do have trees, uh, but it's it's very minimal. Um, uh, we have minimal landscape. So, you know, what I did or didn't do does not have a huge impact on our water, uh, on our water consumption, though we've tried to be uh, careful. I do have a, uh, a uh, rooftop garden uh, that we put in last year, and it's 100% watered with uh, condensate and rainwater uh, through a separate uh, uh, recovery system and tank uh, on that rooftop. Uh, that allow me to irrigate uh, with uh, zero city water. Great. So now, Randy or Roy, how does hard or soft water affect cooling tower efficiency? Randy? Well, well for, for me first, I, I, and I uh, let Roy uh, confirm this. If you have hard water, 
uh, it's, uh, you're going to have more blowdown uh, to maintain uh, the total dissolved solids required uh, to not uh, cause problems with scaling uh, uh, in, in your chillers and your piping. Yeah, that's exactly what, what Randy said. Um, the hard water is going to have more mineral content, so you'll have more blowdown, more gallons of blowdown for every gallon of evaporation um, in that setting. So um, in general, the, the softer your water, the, the higher cycles you can run, the harder the water, the lower cycles you can run. There, and now there are some things you can do to offset it if, if your issue truly is Hardness, you know, a water softener would help. So, um, but but in general, harder water um, does decrease the cycles of concentration. And Roy, this kind of gets back to your presentation a little bit. But if Mike Ortiz in San Juan has a closed loop in his hotel, and can he do anything with condensation? Yeah, Mike, so let me interpret the question a little bit, um, and, and please, um, I guess, follow up if I, if I miss the mark here. Um, I'm assuming you don't have a cooling tower when you say you have a, cl a closed system, but you're obviously, San Juan um, is a place where you would generate a lot of uh, condensate. So really, the, it would be evaluating that water generation against other potential water using processes at, at your facility. Um, I'm going to guess that it's unlikely that you have a steam boiler, but if you did, that's a possible place to use it. Um, once you get outside of the mechanical room, you do, and, and when you're using gray water, then you have, you know, other considerations about human exposure and, um, uh, you know, prior treatment. Uh, before you can use it. I'm thinking if you had a laundry, that might be a place you could use it. You may have to um, do a little pretreatment um, to just ensure that you're not going to have a problem there, but that's, that's a possibility. Um, people have used uh, reused gray water for toilet and urinal flushing. That's very difficult to do in a cost-effective way in an existing facility. Um, but um, it, 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 it's sort of, I would say, take an inventory of your water uses and um, considering the quantities and the quality requirements of each use, see where that condensate might match up. Uh, as I mentioned, for our, for our rooftop garden, uh, we are uh, using it uh, for irrigation. Um, and uh, it's very effective for, for irrigation. Um, you, you do have to take into consideration uh, your drain pan treatment and, and make sure that there's no incompatibility uh, with the chemicals or the drain pan tabs that you're using to treat any systems that you would be collecting uh, condensate from uh, for the end use. Great, that's some good additional info, Randy. So for swimming pools, public health laws may require flushing a certain amount of gallons per bather per day. And apart from this requirement, were you able to save water in other ways for your hotel swimming pool? Uh, I guess the answer is no. And I had not ever heard that requirement. Um, I don't think it's uh, required in our jurisdiction uh, that we would be required to flush uh, uh, any water out. We end up replacing quite a bit from from uh, 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 backwashing and evaporation and splash. Uh, but um, uh, we have not, we've considered, we have an outdoor pool. Uh, it's not a huge pool. It's uh, about a 40,000 gallon pool. Uh, uh, we've considered covering it at night uh, to help with evaporation, but uh, uh, we have not implemented that. Okay, that's some good information. And we're wrapping up 
towards the end of the presentation, but do Roy or Randy, do you have any thoughts on geothermal heat pumps before we conclude? Randy, I don't know if you've used those at any of your properties. If you have, uh, perhaps you could comment on that. Otherwise, I can maybe make some general remarks about it. Uh, I, other than than uh, uh, seeing and learning about it for on a residential uh, basis, I don't have any firsthand uh, knowledge, uh, and I don't know of any properties where we've implemented it uh, commercially. Yeah, I. I um that's the kind of project would, which would require the complete, you know, re redo or re renovation of the, the chiller plant. Um, it, it can, you know, heat pumps in general are very uh, energy and, and water efficient. Um, a geothermal heat pump um, could be a, a water saver compared to a cooling tower, for example. Um, so it's definitely an a, a attractive option, but it's almost from if you're approaching it from designing a, a system from scratch rather than, it, than a retrofit or uh, uh, regime. Okay, well thank you all for your questions. I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie to wrap up the webinar. Okay, uh, someone else asked a question about NPDES permits. Um, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. If you have a specific question, I'm happy to um, take that to our permits office and see if they have an answer for you. But um, I just am not equipped to answer that question. Um, so um, let me just quickly thank Roy, Laura, and Randy for their uh, excellent um, information that they gave everybody today. And Randy, that was a really good case study. I'm just really impressed with all the savings that you've, you've accomplished over there over the years. Um, we appreciate everybody taking time to share their successes and all the really, really great questions we got on the uh, chat box. As we discussed earlier, um, I'm just going to do a little bit of review of the webinar. Um, water use from heating and cooling accounts for more than 10% of a hotel's water use, and single-pass cooling uses 40 times more water to remove the same heat load than a cooling tower. So we really want to see people replace uh, single-pass cooling. If you increase your cycles of concentration from three to six, you can reduce your water use by about 20 percent. Um, and if you want to reduce the amount of makeup water you need for your tower, you can consider routing condensate from your hand, air handlers to your tower basin, or maybe using it in some other opportunity in your, uh, on your facility. Um, and finally, to remember that just implementing water efficiency operations and maintenance practices in your mechanical systems can go a long way towards reducing water use at your hotel. Uh, we covered a lot of ground today, so let's just focus for a minute on some of the things you can do right now to get started uh, making your uh, mechanical systems more water efficient. First. As I said, reduce single-pass cooling or set it to the minimum flow that's required for cooling in all instances. Uh, you can also plan to install and read meters on all of the makeup water lines on your cooling towers, boilers, and chilled water loops, all blow-down water lines, and all condensate return lines. And take a minute to review your water chemistry reports that are generated by your water chemistry vendor uh, and to better understand your cycles of concentration. If the chemistry allows it, you can increase your cycles of concentration to at least six. Um, and then try and return steam condensate back to the boiler and take a look at the facility configuration and see if you can easily route your air handle or condensate back to the cooling tower as makeup water. Um, finally, we hope that today's uh, webinar content was useful. We have two more webinar series training um, coming up in our series this summer, but uh, we're still trying to work out the final dates for those. Uh, once we nail down the dates, the registration links will be posted on the WaterSense website. Um, but in the meantime, the recordings for the five previous webinars that we held in March, April, and May are now available online. These webinars cover details on the hotel challenge itself, water management planning and water assessments, best management practices for sanitary fixtures, laundry equipment, and outdoor water use, and there's also a demonstration of our water use tool. 
Before we wrap up, I'd like to see if anyone on the call has a, a case study they'd be interested in sharing at one of our upcoming webinars. We're mostly looking for hotels that would like to share their experience with commercial kitchen upgrades or employee education programs about water efficient practices. If you're interested in presenting a case study, uh, please type a message into the chat box now or contact the WaterSense helpline and we'll connect you with our hotel challenge staff. We'd also like to conduct one last poll to see if you found the content presented in this webinar helpful. The poll will be launching on your screen right now. Um, but while you're doing that, let me just thank you again for um, attending this presentation. Today's webinar was recorded and will be posted on the website in the future, but you'll receive an email when it's available. Feel free to forward the information to other colleagues who may be interested in today's topic or the Hotel Challenge in general. And if you haven't already, please remember to take the Hotel Challenge pledge that's on the website. This will allow you to receive all of our tools and uh, that, that we're offering to participants, including our logo and everything else. It's all free of charge, and we look forward to talking to you again about our upcoming webinar trainings. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and have a wonderful rest of your day.